Throughout history, there have been many times of conflict with novel or stressful situations which have united the people living through them. In this musical journey, I hope to reflect on the responses and the consequences that certain events have had on the general population, be that immediate reactions or longer lasting effects. Historically, religion and the church has had an extensive influence upon the world. The action of devoting a day or more off from work each week to come together and worship alone would have been enough to demonstrate its importance. But with the addition of the church's sacraments of baptisms, confirmations, marriages and funerals combined with holy days of observance leading to numerous holy days made the church for many the structural fabric of people's day-to-day -day lives. It also developed people's sense of morality and shaped their worldviews. At the beginning of the malady, certain swellings, either on the groin or under the armpits, wax to the bigness of a common apple, others to the size of an egg, some more and some less. And these, the vulgar named, plague boils. Blood and pus seeped out of these strange swellings which were followed by a host of other unpleasant symptoms. Fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhoea, terrible aches and pains, and then, in short order, death. When plague struck Europe in the mid-1300s, it killed approximately 30% of the European population. It may come as no surprise, then, that the Renaissance plague was understood to be a symptom of spiritual degeneracy, even going as far as being described as a divine punishment for sin. Whatever else could be so powerful, so unavoidable? The Black Death caused economic devastation across Europe, leading to famine in many areas. It also forced many churches to close, and stay closed, in the years after the plague, due to a shortage in trained ministers. The spread of the disease among working communities, caused entire skills and trades to be wiped out and lost. However, the scarcity of resources and lack of labour gave greater bargaining power, letting the wages of common folk rise significantly. This somewhat shifted the power balance and decreased inequality between the ruling and working class. In the aftermath of the plague, the richest 10% of the population lost between 15 and 20% of their overall wealth. Naturally, things relapsed somewhat over time, and by the 17th century, inequality of wealth was back to its pre-plague distance. The plague also gave rise to medical inspections, where a plague doctor would come to examine suspected cases and isolate the infected and their family in their homes. The Venetian authorities developed the method of isolating ships in port for 40 days to ensure they weren't infected. This is actually the origin of the word quarantine, from the Italian word for 40. When plague struck Milan in 1576, it quickly shut down the prosperous city. Almost immediately, the civil authorities and notable members of society fled the city, leaving the people of Milan with no support or trade to keep themselves fed. The Archbishop of Milan, Charles Borromeo, unlike the civil authorities and notables, did not abandon the city. Instead, he reportedly stayed to organise the care of those affected and to minister to the dying. He used up his churches and his own possessions, going into debt to provide food for hungry people, with 60 to 70,000 fed daily. Charles Borromeo was greatly loved for his acts by the people of Milan and was made the patron saint of bishops, catechists and seminarians 20 years after his death in 1784. Shortly before his death, he instigated the municipality of Milan to build a temple to St. Sebastian, a saint thought to be a defence against the plague. To commemorate the temple and conquering the plague, the composer, Paolo Caracciolo, was commissioned to write a spiritual madrigal, Santo Guerriere. This madrigal asked God to rid me of this wicked and bothersome poison forever. With the last few years, heading in and out of various lockdowns and navigating some sometimes complex procedures to avoid and hamper the COVID pandemic has hugely impacted mental, physical 
and emotional health. Imagine the relief of finally conquering a plague that has caused as many deaths as the COVID pandemic has had infections. As you reflect on that, enjoy the Cornwall Clark's rendition of Santo Guerriere by Paolo Caracciolo. Santo
The French Revolution was bloody, angry and altogether unpleasant for everyone involved, but it fundamentally changed land ownership and citizenship in France. Before the Anglo-French War of 1778 to 1783, France was economically polarised, with the French elite class living in absolute decadence and the common people in poverty. It was maintained by high taxes for the working class, with little to no taxes for the rich. The Estates General, the body which could alter tax laws, had not met for 150 years, and the king could only control spending, not revenue. The taxes were also highly disorganised and confusing, being collected by private individuals rather than the state. The French population had also rapidly grown from 18 million in the 1700s to 26 million in 1789. Paris alone had 600,000 inhabitants, a third of which was unemployed or had no regular work. This led to food supply issues as farmers struggled to grow enough food and to transport it to where it was needed. The ensuing crisis increased food prices, causing the bread riots. In villages surrounding Paris, this took the form of collective action to force bakers to sell at just prices. In the south of France, mothers with starving families began raiding shops and food stores. Surprisingly, these rioters took the approach of redistribution, choosing to set fair prices and giving the proceeds to the original owner. The National Assembly was created in June of 1789 as a response to growing frustration with the newly reconvened Estates General. It vowed not to separate and to reassemble wherever necessary until the constitution of the kingdom is established. In July of the same year, a revolutionary mob stormed the Bastille to acquire weapons and ammunition. They armed themselves and in doing so, seized a symbol of the monarchy's tyranny as the Bastille was not only a fortress but also used as a political prison. By 1790, the National Assembly had instituted a constitutional monarchy, similar in concept to the UK today. By doing this, they abolished feudalism in France. This moment of solidarity amongst the so-called common folk led to a revolution that rescued a significant portion of people from starvation. This shift in thinking to prioritise the people first led to an environment where concepts of socialism and communism could eventually flourish with the writing of the new constitution. The revolution also seized land that was owned by the Catholic Church, the largest landowner in France with over 10% of French estates. They used this to back a new currency, which rapidly underwent inflation. The September massacres occurred in 1792 when half of Paris's prison population, around 1,500 people, was summarily executed. Later on in the same month, the First Republic was created, and in January, King Louis XVI was executed. Revolutionary fervour in France concerned other countries, leading to many wars being declared, forcing French conscription, creating further internal disruption. The reign of terror began when the Republic set price controls on goods with the death penalty for hoarders and created revolutionary groups to enforce it. This was followed by the law of suspects ordering the arrest of any suspected enemies of freedom. 1793 to 1794, some 16,600 people were executed on charges of counter-revolutionary activity. Another 40,000 may have been summarily executed or died awaiting trial. Further political changes led to the Committee of Public Safety being declared as the supreme revolutionary government and suspended the constitution until peace was achieved. Terror was not confined to Paris. Over 2,000 were killed after the recapture of Lyon. In three months, over 4,000 were drowned in the Loire River. Sometimes executions in Paris were as frequent as 26 a day. The Directory came in power and removed price controls, causing inflation and soaring food prices. By 1796, 500,000 Parisians were reportedly in need of relief, resulting in the May insurrection known as the Conspiracy of the Equals. The revolution initiated a series of conflicts throughout Europe, 
and French colonies that only ended with Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1815. In November 1799, the coup of 18 Brumaire replaced the Directory with the French Consulate, which consisted of three members, Bonaparte, Ducos and Sies, who then asked what he had done during the terror, allegedly answered, I survived. Most historians consider this the end point of the revolution. The French national anthem, La Massieres, was the rally song of the revolution, written in 1792 by Lyle, with the chorus exclaiming, To arms, ye warriors all, your bold battalions cool, march on ye three, death shall be ours, or glorious liberty. I find this to be particularly powerful, as the final line highlights the risk that the French citizenship took in revolting as they faced brutal suppression. The convention accepted it as the first national anthem in 1795. It later lost this status under Napoleon and was outright banned by Louis XVIII and Charles X. In 1879, it was restored as the national anthem and has remained so ever since. The next piece of music, titled March On, takes themes from the orchestration of La Massieres to create a brass interlude that develops into a three-part harmony representing many voices with a single singer. Alongside women's suffrage, war was the defining feature for the first half of the 20th century. With the First World War claiming an estimated 40 million lives and the second estimated at 75 million, war caused huge generational gaps across nations and profoundly affected the survivors, known as the Lost Generation. Virtually no town or family was left untouched. 
Whereas the First World War took place largely in enormous trench complexes, the second flattened cities across Europe and caused almost twice the number of civilian casualties as military personnel. 27 million people were being forced to leave their countries, with at least 60 million forced to leave their homes. This war, more than any other in history, blurred the lines between soldiers and civilians, with the front line of the war becoming many people's homes. This came to a peak with the atomic bombing of the cities Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. The world wars left a mark on the world that, for the good of the human race, should never be removed. Although the war had ended, the bid to win the Second World War brought about a spectre that will likely never leave us. Even among this horrific part of history, there were moments of great solidarity. One of the most famous of these moments was the Christmas truce of 1914 and the reported football match between enemies. Describing this heartbreaking event, Lieutenant Kurt Zemisch of the 134th Saxons wrote, How marvellous, how wonderful, yet how strange it was. Fighting a war is a concept so far separated from our lives today, it is truly hard to imagine. Even more so, the experience of getting a reprieve from it, of having the opportunity to truly humanise the people in the trenches across from you as something other than the enemy, and then having to try and kill them the next day. The tradition of collectively holding a minute's silence to remember the sacrifices of the armed forces and mourn for the civilians lost developed as a response to the world wars. Many people in the Commonwealth observed the two-minute silence on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month each year to celebrate Armistice Day. In the UK, we repeat this moment of silence on Remembrance Sunday and close it with the buglers sounding the last post. This is also shared by Australia and New Zealand with a ceremony held at dawn on Anzac Day on the 25th of April. In Israel, Moments of silence are held in memory of the victims of the Holocaust on Yom HaShoah. In Japan, a minute of silence is observed and televised nationally at ceremonies every August in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the same times as the atomic bombings occurred. Between 1915 and 1918, recordings were made by Wilhelm Dogen in Berlin using British prisoners of war during their captivity. Mr. Dogen was a German sound pioneer who had made over a thousand voice recordings onto primitive shellac discs. These have now all been digitised, though they have a distinctive listening quality, and can be viewed free online. The contents in the recordings varies and includes reading passages, word lists, speeches and recitals of songs and folk tales in a variety of languages and dialects. The piece you are about to hear features regional accents from all across Great Britain reading the biblical parable, The Prodigal Son. In the story, the eldest son takes his inheritance, travels to a foreign land and squanders it. Returning home penniless and starving, he is forgiven, welcomed and greatly celebrated. The many mothers and fathers who have and will lose their children to war and never have them return is a solemn reminder of the cost of war. Many of those who did return were permanently affected by their experience, often with physical and mental scars. This reflection is quite relevant considering the huge amount of life lost then and since the World Wars, and is brought home to us within the present Russian-Ukrainian war. This original composition, titled Lost, looks to capture heartbreak and that feeling of loss, where nothing feels quite real anymore. Father, the 
Nuclear war is the most devastating threat to human life in all of known history. There are sufficient nuclear weapons, both during the Cold War and today, to destroy the entire world several hundred times over. The insane ability to eradicate and poison that even one weapon possesses makes them unparalleled in the indiscriminate magnitude of their destruction. The term Cold War was coined by the writer George Orwell at the end of World War II in his essay, You and the Atomic Bomb. He warned of the peace that is no peace, under a shadow of the threat of nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. The Cold War is commonly considered to be between the late 1940s and the early 1990s, consisting of competition between the USA and the USSR to become the world's dominant superpower. It was largely dictated by the nuclear arms race. Throughout this period, in every country that had nuclear programs or developed nuclear weapons, there were protests and calls to end the nuclear era. It cannot be understated that when it comes to nuclear, the global community was all equal in death. This paints a rather grim image, so a huge part of public information circulated during the period took a cartoonish or satirical approach to shrink the massive threat enough to be understandable and comprehensible. Teaching children at school about the serious threat of nuclear war without scaring them was a delicate task. At schools, films like 
Bert the Turtle we use to provide a pleasant, amusing character as a face of the nuclear safety, with the protocols being likened to having procedures in place through a fire response. On the television, there were public information films, which took a matter-of-fact attitude with a very British sense of keep calm and carry on. Alongside these responses, Tom Lehrer somewhat stood out as a mathematician, then American draftee, comedy satirist, and musician. His music makes light of many topics from Nazi scientists becoming NASA pioneers and rampant academic plagiarism to the rather ridiculous notion of poisoning pigeons in the park. In 1959, he wrote a song that highlights both the horror and the inherent black comedy of the Times nuclear policy of MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. These different aspects of Cold War attitude mix to make a very chilling hindsight image to an age where people were very aware that a choice, misunderstanding or mistake could lead to the end of the world. This next piece is based on the 1960s public information film titled Protect and Survive and features Tom Lehrer's song We Will All Go Together When We Go and audio from the 1951 animation Bert the Turtle. After all, if nuclear war occurs, ensure your curtains are closed. I always like to end on a positive note, so here is a rousing, uplifting song which is guaranteed to cheer you up. A warning may come quite unexpectedly. We will now tell you what to do if a warning sounds when you are at home. And then we will explain what to do if you are out of doors. First, if you are at home. If attack is imminent, you will hear the attack sound like this. and turn off the gas and the electricity at the mains. Close down stoves. Damp down fires. Shut windows. And draw curtains. Then go to your fallout room and stay there. If the fallout warning sounds are heard, they will be like these. You should now move yourself and your family to the safest area in your fallout room. That is, you should get inside your inner refuge and stay there. After two days, the danger from fallout will get less, but don't take any risks by contact with it. The longer you stay in your refuge, the better it will be for you. Listen to your radio. Stay where you are and keep listening to your radio. Now, this is what you should do if you are out of doors when the warning sounds. Take cover at once when you hear the attack sound. cannot reach home in 10 minutes, take cover in the nearest building. If there is no building nearby, try to find some solid cover. If there is no solid cover, lie flat in a ditch or a hole and cover your head, face and hands as fast as you can with some of your clothes. If you hear the fallout warning, remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flag? Seek the nearest and best cover as quickly as you can. 
But before entering the building or cover, brush or shake off any fallout dust you may have picked up and get rid of it. Or change your outer clothes to the end. Stay under cover. When the all clear sounds like this, it means that you are safe from attack or fallout for the time being and that you can go out again. But keep listening for further warnings or to your radio for further advice. For many young people, nuclear war is not something new or raw on the consciousness of the world. Living in a neighbourhood out of the centre of Birmingham, with a lovely park nearby, put me in a very lucky position going into the Covid lockdowns. There are many of those who know of or who are Covid vulnerable, and life for those people during the lockdowns and after was a shocking change. For many, it was the first time in their lives when they met a large, potentially fatal threat they could do very little to prevent or affect. This change varies with experiences of key workers who are often working longer and harder in difficult positions but with greater social contact, and those working and studying and isolating at home with nearly all of their normal routines and activities gone meant people were stripped of their regular support networks. Waiting for vaccines and hearing more and more news of other countries locking down while hearing ever-rising infection and death rates, built the narrative of COVID never really leaving us. My paternal grandmother had moved into a nursing home in the new year of 2020 due to severe vascular dementia. When I saw her for the last time Christmas 2019 before heading back to Birmingham, she didn't know who any of her family were. But she knew she was safe and that we all cared for her. Moving into the home brought many stresses to her, with so many other people she didn't trust and my extended family visiting her made this somewhat tolerable. Covid made the final couple years of her life confusing and unknown. My family and I fortunately by no means were hit hard by Covid and there are so many tragic stories spawned from this period of time in our lives. Hopefully going forward we can use our shared experiences of horrors and joys to build new positive traditions and to continue our important old ones. Maybe this unity could help us take on the ever-looming climate change catastrophe, or simply help us find peace in the world now. The final piece is an in-the-box production that was drafted in the midst of our first Covid lockdown, and is a reflection of the nature I was able to walk around during our one exercise per day restricted period. It is simply titled Garden. 